Morning, Wellsboro Bible Church. My name is Joshua McLaren. I'm a pastoral assistant here at Wellsboro Bible. And as we search the scriptures, we learn that we as humans, we exist to glorify God. And one of the ways we glorify God is by praising him. So if you're curious to know, what does Boylesboro Bible believe? What do they believe about praising God? What, is, what does that look like practically? We'd love for you to visit us at our starting point ministry. So if you're a visitor, um, we wanna welcome you and we would love to meet you at starting point. So it's out your double doors, these double doors, excuse me, to my right. Um, we have some excellent staff as well as some elders there after the service that would love to answer your questions. And if you're curious about events happening throughout the week, opportunities to praise our God corporately through, through Bible study or even through refresh services or thing like, things like that, please fill out the check-in tablets. Now these are all the way at the beginning of your row on your left on the armrest. Um, please just fill that out, fill out your information. That way we can keep in contact with you and Josh, we can continue to reach out to you. Is yeah. it true that you, you actually go visit every single person who writes their name down? <laughs> that, that is not true. Oh. But you do pray for him. We do, yes. Okay. And good. actually, that's another way we, we seek to praise our God is through prayer. Thanks for that transition, TJ. Seamless. Got your back. Uh, it's through prayer. So uh, in your bulletin, not only do you have your sermon notes in there, but you also have a blue prayer card. Now, if you have a, a prayer of praise or a prayer request, we'd love for you to please fill that out, fold it up, and, and place it in the offering plate as it goes by. Now, you may have noticed there is a photo booth out here, and that is actually to help us know who we're reaching out to when we're, when we're looking to contact you guys. So if you, if you don't have a Breeze profile, that's okay. Um, visit us, we'll create one for you, and we'd love to put you into our system so we can know um, how to contact you, where to contact you. And finally, we have an opportunity to praise our God through fellowship today after the service. So that will be a hot dog roast right after the service. It's gonna be held right out on the, on the parking lot. Um, and if, if you did not bring a dish to pass, that is okay. Please join us. We would love to get to know you more and, and fellowship with you. So right after the service in the parking lot. Josh, which doors do I go out to get to the hot dogs? You could go through any doors, however. Which is the fastest? The fastest? Yeah. Um, the double doors in that hallway or these double doors and then just walk around. The hot dogs are going to be over here with the food where the building kind of L's. Thank you. Yes, and it's a little shady there, so that, that should keep the sun away. Thank you, Josh. You guys, you guys are done, right? You're I think no so. more. <laughs> okay. Yes. What if I said no? <laughs> well, then I guess we'll wait. No, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's now take a moment of silence and prepare our hearts for worship this morning. Let's reflect on just who God is. He is worthy of all praise and glory. And just pray that he would remove any distractions and that, um, yeah, let's just, just raise the roof of praising God this morning. <laughs> so just uh, prepare your hearts for worship. And then um, after a certain period of time, I will break that silence with the reading of scripture. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain for our rebellion against God, he's so worthy of all praise and glory. And this should all just, this should just motivate all of us to want to just, just sing out and sing praises to Christ, our Redeemer. And so now let's stand and sing all creatures of our God and King.
service where we're going to be collectively praying as, as one body in Christ. So I'd like to call a couple of people to the stage, Wayne Zook and Vicki Bever. Looks like they're already on their way. Wayne's going to be leading us in a prayer of praise. And then Vicki is going to lead us uh, reading from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. And then Josh is going to lead us in a prayer of confession. 
Now this is an often neglected but extremely important part of, of a church service where we as one body are, are going, we're going to humble ourselves before the Lord and confess our sins to him. And then we'll respond to that prayer by an scriptural assurance of pardon. Please bow your heads and join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you praise that we are able to come and exalt your name this morning, that you grant us the opportunity and the privilege to bring honor and glory to you as only you are worthy of. Great are you, Lord, and highly to be praised. Your greatness is unsearchable and your understanding is infinite. We praise you with all our creation. You made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. You provide rain for the earth and cause the grass to grow. And you command where the wind should blow. You number the stars and have given them names. We praise you for your sovereignty over creation. We praise you because you are righteous in all that you do and kind in all your deeds. We can confidently trust that you work all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. <clears throat> Though often we don't understand or see the whole picture, we praise you for the perfect justice that you execute. How awesome is a cross, Lord, where perfect justice and love meet. We praise you for the salvation and reconciliation that the cross offers. You are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and great in loving kindness. You are near to all who call upon you in truth, and you heal the brokenhearted. We have so many reasons and so much to praise you for. It is good to sing praises to our God, but too often we are easily distracted. We bow before you and honor you as king, whose kingdom is everlasting. Your dominion endures throughout all generations. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'd like to preface our reading today by saying that our focus is on God's beloved son, Jesus Christ, who is the he in the him in the scripture passage. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven making peace by the blood of his cross. Would you join me in a prayer of confession to our God? Almighty God, King of the universe, holy and righteous, we come before you. And I think of the words of Paul you know, we sit in a service like this and we can't help but praise you. But in our hearts, Father, like Paul, we often do what we do not want to do and we want to do what we do not do. Father, confess, we, we, we ask for forgiveness and confess our pride. That the root of pride is a desire to dethrone you and to take away the praise and the worship and the glory that you deserve. Father, forgive us for thinking that we are the ones who are sovereign. We are the ones who control our circumstances. Father, forgive us for when those, that, that truth is crumbled, 
for, forgive us for when we recognize that we do not control our circumstances, we become angry. We get frustrated. And the last thing we want to do is praise you. Father, forgive us for our selfishness in this in thinking that the world may revolve around us. But Father, truly, you are the one who breathes life. You are the one who breathes the stars. You are the one in whom everything holds together. Father, forgive us. Cleanse us of our unrighteousness. In Christ's name, amen. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 5 tell us, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. Church, Christ came and lived the the perfect, sinless life that, that we aren't capable of. And he endured the Father's wrath toward our sin. He paid that price in full. It is in that truth, Christ's work on the cross, that we have our assurance of salvation. And so now let's sing, stand and sing and respond to that glorious truth by singing in Christ alone. is far.
joy it is to stand in the power of Christ. It's not a bad thing to say that it's in Christ alone we stand. There's nothing better. In Christ alone, we have everything. And that drives us to just praise. And the next song we're going to sing is called, Oh, Praise the Name. This is a song I love to sing because this body just belts it out. So do that this morning, please. Um, but there's one part where there's a scripture reading and kind of an instrumental moment. And then you'll see some of us here will kind of start singing in the background over top of that scripture. And I thought I'd invite the whole congregation to do that. It's kind of like we're raising our song in chorus with this scripture declaring the holiness of God. So just kind of keep an eye out for that. But let's sing together. Oh, praise the name.
may be seated. I'd like to take a moment to pray for our offering. Uh, before we do, uh, as always, a note to our guests, please feel no obligation to give. We are just, just happy that you are here. Uh, this is something that our members understand to be giving a portion of the money that God has blessed them with to continue supporting the ministry of Wellsboro Bible Church and also the ministries that we support. And, uh, of course, there are many ways to give. You can give physically here. Um, you can set it up through the website online, through text messages. Yeah, there they are. Uh, many different ways that you can give. So, let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for the ministry of this church. We thank you for the opportunity and privilege to be your ambassadors to this fallen world by proclaiming the good news of the gospel. We thank you for blessing us financially, and, and now we give a, a portion back. We ask it would be used wisely so that we can reach every man, woman, and child with the gospel, and that you will be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.
Church, you may be seated. My name is Pastor Ben Garner, and I have the privilege of overseeing children's ministry and enjoy serving those children. So if you are a new person that's coming that has children this morning, welcome. Uh, we have a check-in area that is just below the steps. If you missed the children's ministry sign, is that you come in the front doors down to the right. So if you have children that are in grades nursery through fourth grade, we have a children's ministry for them. Uh, we have a team of dedicated uh, screened workers that serve them throughout the service, and it's a joy to do that for you. So at this time, we're going to bow our heads and pray for the children in children's ministry as well as those that will be here in the sanctuary this morning. So let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Lord, you're faithful in all your words, and you are kind in all of your works. And Lord, as the children this morning learn about King Saul, and when David approached him on the th in the cave and cut off the corner of his robe, Father, we thank you that uh, he had mercy against his leader because, God, you chose King Saul. And, Father, as the children learn about this story this morning, I pray that their, your word would come to fruition in their lives. Father, if there's children in the children's ministry or in the sanctuary that do not know you as Lord and Savior, we pray that they'll be convicted of their sin and they'll repent and they'll turn from you as the gospel goes forth. Father, give the children's ministry workers this morning patience and endurance. And Father, for the children in the sanctuary this morning, we pray for a calmness of spirit and be with the parents this morning as they're training and discipling them. Father, thank you for this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, if you are a child in grades one through four, uh, you may stand and walk to the back of the sanctuary following the blue shirt volunteers. It's good to see you all this morning, and it's good to sing with you. I like how Ben was like, I'm so excited to be with, working with the kids this morning. <laughs> Does, well, I didn't think it was that believable. I don't know. Uh, but here's, here's something I've been thinking about a lot. Seven years ago and before that, there was a time where there were not any children in the church. And a group of ladies would gather regularly to faithfully pray that God would bring children to the church and man, has he brought children to the church. It's just been baby wave after baby wave. As Pastor Mike always says, you guys are so good at making little disciples. You just keep making them. I hope you're discipling them as well. Um, sometimes it's difficult, and I say this as a parent of four kids, to know how to manage your children well throughout the service. So here's my encouragement to you. Um, Pray for the parents who are in the room and are trying to manage this baby wave that's going on. If you hear baby noises and that distracts you, here's what you can do is use that as an opportunity to praise the Lord because he's continuing to be faithful to his promise to raise up people in every generation who declare his glory. Well, this morning we begin a series. It's one of my most favorite series we do regularly around here through the book of Psalms. Why don't we just pause and ask that the Lord would help us as we prepare to study the Psalms together this morning. God, this morning we do come before you understanding that we exist for your glory. As we've already seen in the scriptures this morning, all things were made for you. They were made by you. They're sustained or upheld by you. We do nothing without you, and so you are so worthy of our praise. Would you please impress that upon our hearts this morning, that we might live for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. If you need a Bible, there are some men coming forward right now who will provide one, but if you brought your own, you can take it out right now and open up to Psalm 148. If you should be using our Bibles, you'll be on page 526. So there are a lot of powerful things in the world. If you drove in, you, you probably drove in a powerful vehicle. 
into a parking lot full of powerful vehicles. I was trying to add up in my mind how many horsepower are just sitting out there on the parking lot. What the equivalent, if that many horses were here, what that would look like. And that leads to another powerful thing. Things like horses. I would not want to be trampled by a horse. Or, or come into contact with a wild animal like a bear. You know, you, you leave your bird feeder out this time of year on a metal pole, and the bear just bends it to the ground. I tried to tell my wife it was me who did that, but she doesn't believe me. Uh, maybe you've traveled to some places and seen some powerful things. It's pretty powerful to stand on the edge of the Grand Canyon, even ours, and look across. It's powerful to go to Niagara Falls and, and just watch the water pouring over the lip of the falls. This world is full of powerful things. But there are few things as powerful as the human emotion. Our emotions have, man, such a powerful grip on us. They have the ability to influence us in such a way that our actions and our thoughts are directed by the emotions. Some emotions, like love, are powerful enough to make you do and say funny things. Other emotions, like anger, can make you say things that you quickly regret. The emotion of joy can make you feel like a million bucks. Well, sorrow can bring you so low that you may even lose the will to live. There are few things in your life as powerful as your emotions. And some emotions at times can feel so powerful that we feel like we're out of control. And yet, as Christians, we are called to submit even our emotions to the authority of Scripture and to the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, I think it's important that we re recognize that we're emotional beings because God made us to be emotional beings. And he's the one who made our emotions so powerful. And it's a beautiful thing when you see human emotion exercised under the authority of the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you got a taste of that as we were singing this morning. I love to just declare those praises together. It's an emotional thing to sing with all of you. That emotion is informed by what I understand about God and what I know about his people. I don't think there's anywhere in Scripture where the emotions are put on a more brilliant display than they are in the Psalms. The Psalms show us the entire spectrum of human emotion. In the Psalms, you will find exceeding joy and you will find deep sorrow. You'll see longing and love and questioning and fear and anger and eagerness and excitement. And when we study the Psalms, we are encouraged because we understand that no matter what emotions we experience or how powerful they are, we're not alone. And God means to move in us through those emotions, just as he moved in the psalmist. Even the style of the psalms reflects this emotional outpouring. The psalms are written as poetry. In fact, they were poetry that is meant to be set to music, and the psalms were the hymn book of the Jews. Even today, in many churches, many churches they're singing the psalms. The psalms are meant to drive us to deep reflection. They're meant to encourage us, to give us hope, to redirect us, to comfort us, to inspire and correct us. Like ointment for a wound, the Psalms bring healing to the human soul. So it is with joy this morning that we enter into this short summer series called the Psalms of Summer. So for the next several weeks, we'll just be going through various psalms together. This morning, we begin with Psalm 148. Would you follow along as I read this psalm for us? <clears throat> Praise. 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For he commanded and they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth. You great sea creatures in all deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word. Mountains in all hills, fruit trees in all cedars, beasts in all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people, Praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. Church, this psalm boils over with emotion. Charles Spurgeon, when preparing to preach this psalm, said, I could hardly figure out how to divide it. It is just one eruption of praise. The emotion of the psalmist here are so powerful because they are brought on by the psalmist's reflection on the holiness of God and the sovereignty of God and his kindness to all creation, especially his people. As you probably have gathered, this is a psalm of praise. In 14 verses, the word praise is repeated 13 times. And I've attempted to capture that theme in a statement. If you look in your bulletin, there's a half a sheet of notes in there. Um, that paper is meant as a take-home for you so that you can kind of remember what we talked about this morning. And the statement in those notes is kind of a summary of the text we're studying. The statement this morning is this. Praise the Lord, for he is worthy. Praise the Lord for... Or because he is worthy. So we started our, our service this morning with a hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King. And we started there because that hymn is a call to worship in line with this scripture. It's a call not just for us to praise the Lord. It's a call for the sun and the moon and all created things and especially his redeemed people. To praise the Lord. The theme of that song was taken from this very psalm. And my prayer throughout this service, beginning with that moment all the way through now, is that we would learn to praise the Lord afresh. You know, I, I sat in my study this week preparing to preach this sermon. And I, I had a sense of what Charles Spurgeon was talking about. I felt so inadequate to try to capture what it means to praise the Lord. And I realized as I was sitting there, I'm not the one who has to capture it. God, the Holy Spirit, inspired this word, and it is his word that's powerful. And so it's just simply my prayer that as I stand here as a mere human, trying to declare the praises of God, that your heart would be moved to praise him afresh this morning. God is so magnificent. And so different from us, it's so hard as a human to come up with the words to praise him. But we know that we are called to praise him because he truly is worthy. And so I've chosen to divide this psalm into two parts. There's the first six verses, which call to the heavens to praise the name of the Lord. And then the rest, which calls the things on the earth to praise the Lord. So let's start with the first six verses and the first point is praise from the heavens. 
praise from the heavens. Look at verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Three times. Praise, praise, praise. When you praise something, you're making a statement about how great that thing is. You're declaring the worth or the value of that thing. When you praise something, you're giving your admiration and your affection and your appreciation and your attention to the object of your praise. To praise the Lord means to declare his greatness. So imagine this psalmist reflecting on the greatness of God and then having this desire to see all of creation praise his name. So it's almost like throughout this psalm, he's assembling a choir. And it will be the most brilliant, beautiful choir there ever was. And it will include elements of all of creation. And then that choir will join together, as we did this morning, with one voice to praise the Lord. So he begins in the heavens. He calls the created things to give glory to God that that abide or reside in the heavens. In the second verse, he calls on the angels. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. We don't know a lot about the angels. I mean, there's, there's quite a bit there in Scripture, but the average person just doesn't have a good working knowledge of what the angels do. But we do know, I think all of us, that the angels exist to glorify God. We see them in Scripture as God's messengers that he sends to earth. We see them in heaven, standing around the throne, crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And the psalmist here calls upon these angels, these beings that are, that are a little too broad for us to even get our minds around. He calls on them to do what they were made to do and to praise God. But not just angels. He calls on the heavenly hosts. We sing about the heavenly hosts in the doxology. Praise God from all, whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Maybe you've been singing that and you really didn't even know what you were singing. But that is the idea that it's not just the angels who praise God. It's the armies of angels. That's what the hosts refer to. And those armies of angels number in the millions. So the psalmist pictures this, this whole chorus, millions of angels praising the Lord. Their purpose, like the rest of creation, is to bring glory to God in that way. You know, this is where Satan went wrong. He was an angel. He was created to bring glory to God. He was one of the most radiant and beautiful angels. And he should have pointed to the glory of God more than anyone else. But instead, in pride, he wanted the glory to come to himself. And he convinced a large number of other angels to follow him. And he fell from heaven. And he will suffer for eternity along with those fallen angels because of his rebellion. The angels were made to give praise to God, not to, to turn that glory upon themselves. So it is right that the psalmist calls for the angels to praise. And then he moves on to some other parts of creation. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. I love looking into the heavens. I think the sun is amazing. I try not to look at too much because I think that's bad for you. But it really is an amazing part of creation. It's so amazing that throughout history, people have feared the sun and even worshipped the sun. But we know as Christians, the sun is not to be worshipped. It was created by God on the fourth day as God's tool to bring light to the earth. Without the light of the sun... Not only would it still be dark, but plants would not receive the energy that they need to grow. And life on earth would not be sustainable. But it isn't only light that the sun brings. Without the warmth of the sun, 
all the creatures of the earth would freeze and die. The sun is an impressive and very necessary part of our galaxy. In our particular solar system, the sun makes up 99.9% of the mass in the entire system. If you were to take the earth and just keep adding something the same size as the earth to the sun, you could fit one million earths in the circumference of the sun. All of the planets in the solar system are kept in place by the sun's gravitational pull. And if the sun were to just shift a little bit, everything would go into chaos. In fact, if the sun were just a little bit closer to the earth, all the water on the planet would boil and evaporate and be gone. If the sun were any further away, all the water on the earth would be permanently frozen. The sun has a powerful effect on us and on all the creatures of the earth. And yet, the psalmist looks to the sun and says, no, you praise the Lord. Our focus isn't on you. Your purpose isn't you. You exist, sun, to praise God. The same charge is given to the moon and the stars. There's nothing like standing out in a really dark place and looking up at the stars. When you do that, you feel so small and insignificant. It is awe-inspiring, which is why another psalmist in Psalm 8 wrote, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? And yet... All those billions of stars and the bright, beautiful moon are just a part of God's creation. He just hung them there in place effortlessly. So they are called to do what God made them to do, to bring him glory and to declare his praise. Then the psalmist refers to the highest of heights, making sure that there is nothing in the heavens left undone. Those things far beyond what we can see. Those things should praise the Lord. And then he uses this poetic phrase describing the rain, the waters in the heavens. All things are called to praise the Lord. This, this call is a, a universal call to all the created things in the heaven. Give praise to God. And then after giving the call to praise, he gives the reason for the praise. Look at verse 5. Let them praise the name of the Lord for. Anytime you see the word for, think of it as because or this is the explanation. This is why I'm to do this. For God commanded and they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree, and it shall not pass away. So where did the angels come from? Where did the sun come from, or the stars, or the moon? How did they get there? God didn't just make them. He merely spoke, and they came into existence. The most intricate, far out, too wonderful for our minds to understand things in the heavens, came into being because God spoke. What a powerful God he is. What a wise God he is. He is a very capable genius. And there's a reason the sun stays in its place and doesn't shift at all. There's a reason the earth orbits the sun and that the stars hang there and don't just fall out of the sky. It's because, as the psalmist says, the Lord has decreed that they should be there. He just placed laws over them to keep them wherever he wanted them to be. You can think of God as the greatest physicist of all. Uh, the, sci the best scientists of earth are just discovering the things that God thought up and put into place. He's an amazing God. And his commands or his decrees will not pass away. There's nothing that can undo things like gravity, the laws of physics and science. 
The heavenly creation is called to praise God because it's all his. And he is so worthy of that praise. But that's not the only thing that belongs to God. The psalmist also calls, in addition to the things in heaven, the things on earth to praise the Lord. And you'll see that reflected in our second point. Praise from the earth. Praise from the earth. Look at verse 7. Praise the Lord from the earth. So in the verses that follow, the psalmist cries out to all of the creation that exists on the earth. And he begins with the great sea creatures in all deeps. So this includes everything in the sea. From the largest whale to the smallest marine bacteria. Scientists have discovered thousands and thousands of things living in the ocean. And they report that they believe there are thousands and thousands of things more. It's the estimation of science that maybe only two-thirds of the things that live in the ocean have actually been seen by human eyes. There could be just hundreds of thousands of things living out there that no person has ever even seen. We don't even know about it. The oceans are unfathomably deep and teeming with life and beauty and mystery. Sometimes I imagine what it would be like to be lost at sea. You ever do that? Think about like if the plane went down and for some reason that life raft under your seat actually works and you can get out of the plane and you're just floating there. What that would feel like. And you'd probably drift away from other people. You'd try not to, but before you know it, you'd be on your, on your own. Imagine how helpless you would feel lost in the middle of the ocean. It's almost like so vast it's suffocating. I, I think I would feel oddly claustrophobic being so small in such a vast place. And I would be really worried about what was underneath me. There are a lot of things under there that would just eat you in a moment. The seas are amazing. They're so much bigger than us, we can't even understand them. And yet they are just a part of God's creation. He thought them up. He spoke them into existence. He's sovereign over them. So the seas and everything in them are called to praise the Lord. The psalmist moves on in verse 8 to fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word. These are the things that, that come from the clouds. That fire is likely a reference to lightning. And then the hail and snow and the mist. These are all part of God's creation. Just like the wind that blows wherever he wants it to blow. All of these things were created by God to give him praise. Then in verse 9, the psalmist calls on the mountains and all the hills. So from the, the smallest elevation all the way up to the towering heights of Mount Everest, all of that is called to give praise to God. He moves on to the forest and to the field by calling on fruit trees and all cedars. I like the poetry here a lot. The fruit trees give the idea of, of those trees which actually bear fruit. And then the cedars are a general reference for all the non-fruit-bearing trees. So this is just a call for all the trees of every kind. Kind of takes you back to Genesis in your mind. Then he calls, in verse 10, the beasts and all the livestock. The beasts referring to the wild animals and livestock, of course, being domesticated animals. He then again says all the animals, like the birds that fly through the air or the ants and the spiders and the things that creep along the ground. And the pattern continues in verses 11 and 12. But the stakes get higher because here is where the psalmist calls on people to praise the Lord. But before we get there, I have to ask you a question. How is it that all of those things we've been talking about actually praise the Lord? I mean, can something without a mind or a soul or the ability to speak actually praise God? Is the psalmist just being poetic here? 
Is this some exercise in futility? How can these other parts of creation praise the Lord? How, how does the sun praise God? How does the, the moon or a, a millipede praise God? What can the psalmist possibly be trying to do here? Well, the answer is, those things are fully capable of praising God. The whole creation praises the Lord merely by doing that which God created it to do. When a, a cow grazes in a pasture, it is praising the Lord because that is exactly what God made that cow to do. When the, when the sun shines, it is praising the Lord because God made the sun to give its light to the earth. When all of the things of the earth function in the way that God intended, it is a beautiful chorus praising God. The weather obeys his commands. All things in nature obey his commands. Psalm 19.1 tells us that when that happens, it actually points us to God. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. And then in Romans 1, we learn that God reveals even his character and his nature and thereby his glory through created things. Romans 1, you could write this in the margin of your notes and read this later this afternoon. I'll read verses 18 through 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and un ungodliness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, listen to this, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So people are without an excuse. Nature proclaims the character and the glory of God. Those things naturally praise him. And that brings our attention back to verses 11 and 12. Verse 11, kings of the earth and all people, princes and all rulers of the earth, Young men and maidens together, old men and children. So in the same pattern, the psalmist is covering all parts of this portion of creation. He's, he's calling for every person, no matter if it's the greatest king, the lowliest peasant, the youngest infant, the oldest person alive, men, women, children. Everyone is called to praise God together. And the reason why is given in verse 13. Let them praise the name of the Lord for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. We are to praise God because his name alone is to be exalted or lifted up or elevated as worthy of our praise. His majesty is above earth and heaven. There's nothing better than him. So to put it bluntly, God is better than you. He's better than anything in this world. He's better because he's the one who made it all. This was all his idea. When you look around the earth, what you see is the wisdom of of God and the wonder of God and the brilliance of God and the power of God. This spring, my family and I have spent a lot of time hiking. We've seen some pretty amazing waterfalls. We've stood at the edge of the canyon. We've walked through mountain laurel. We've stood under gigantic hemlocks. And being out there, I'm just amazed at what God has done. I think about times I've seen things like when you look under a microscope and, and you get down to the cellular level and you see the intricacy that's there. It's just amazing to see what God has done. 
as I mentioned earlier, when you stand under the stars. As a dad, when I watch my children grow and I understand that that's what God made them to do, to mature and be strengthened and to learn more every day, that's an amazing thing to see. When I think about how our senses work, you know, God didn't have to give us taste buds, but sushi wouldn't be the same without them. Or your hearing, the intricacy of the human eye. Um, I used to be a photographer when I was church planting. That was kind of a side business. And I, I had a, a professional camera, and it was really good, but it couldn't do near what the human eye can do. The way our eyes focus and take in things at great distances and also see up close at the same time, it's just amazing what the human eye can do. What God has done is really too wonderful for us to understand. What, what he's made and how he's made it, you just can't get there mentally. You, you can't figure that out. He's so much greater. And we pay attention to things that are great. You know why people love professional sports? Because those guys do some amazing things. It, it's a, a wonderful thing to see an athlete just do things that you in your own strength and athletic prowess could not do. We love to tune into great things. You like to see great speakers. We love to study great wars. We like to see great things. And if you're a true sportsman, if someone's better than you, you're apt to go tell them that. You know, they compete against you. They win legitimately. You're, you, you should tell them, great job. That was wonderful. Well, how much more when we recognize God's greatness, should we give him the praise due his name? More than being interested in, in the athletics of this world or, or the beauties that surround us, we should be reminded that God is the one who made it all and nothing in this world even compares to his greatness. If you want to be amazed and stand in awe and be driven to worship, consider the greatness of God. That's what the psalmist is doing here. That's all. And as he closes out this psalm, he points us really to the most amazing thing of all. See, God made man special or distinct from the rest of creation. You are not a wild animal. You are not um, an inanimate object. You have a soul. You have a mind. You have the ability to communicate with each other and with God. But most impressive of all, you're made in God's image. You're an image bearer of God. And in making you an image bearer, God gave you some pretty amazing responsibilities. The purpose of all mankind, including you, is to spread around the earth and to make his name known. To be his steward, to be his representative, to bear his image. That's why he said in Genesis, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. God made us in his image to declare his glory. Which is what makes sin so horrible. You know the story, in the garden, Adam and Eve strayed from that purpose. They believed the lie of the devil, that God was holding something back from them. So it started with Eve, she was tempted, she ate the forbidden fruit, not because she thought it looked tasty, but because she thought it would give her knowledge that would put her on par with God, not far off from what Satan did. Then she convinced her husband, and he ate the fruit as well, and humanity fell. And sin has been with us ever since. That's why there's bad things in this world. That's why there's disease. That's why there are things like anger and frustration. That's why there's death. We're God's image bearers, made to show his glory. But instead, just as Josh prayed earlier today, we've tried to get the glory for ourselves. We want our own comfort. We want our own peace. We, we want to have a, a nice beautiful American dream. So you, you work hard, you raise a cute little family, you store away some money, you travel a little bit, and then you die. That's the pattern in which most of us are living. And yet, God is so clear that we don't exist for ourselves. We exist for his glory. 
As we talked about in 1 Peter, we're sojourners and exiles here. This isn't even our home. So what's so shocking and so beautiful, as the psalmist concludes, he reminds us that there are people who are brought near to the Lord. We are those people. So how does that happen? How do do people who have strayed from God still have the ability to come near him? Because remember, he's a just God and he must punish sin. Hell was created for sinners. The answer is in the fact that he sent his own son to live a perfect life and then to die in our place. Christ came. So that sinners like you and like me could once again be brought near to God. At the cross, Christ took the punishment for all of our sins. And when you trust in Christ, all of your sin is transferred to him. And his righteousness is transferred to you. The reason you can come near to God now, despite your sin is the fact that Christ's righteousness is what God sees when he looks at you. If you have not yet come to a place in your life where you have placed your faith in Christ and you believe what I just said, this morning is a good wake-up call. Understand that God brought you here and he just presented the truth to you through a sermon like this. Even this morning, you have the chance in your seat to turn from your sins, to trust Christ, to apologize to God for sinning against him and to follow after him. Don't miss that opportunity. And if you've been saved, this morning is such a kind nudging from God. It's not even a nudging. It is a shove. This is a shove from the Lord calling you to Live for the praise of his glory. Don't go on living for the trinkets of this world knowing that you've already been given the treasures of heaven. Don't go on considering how worthy he is of your praise and then get out in the parking lot and eat a hot dog and forget about it and go home and live for your own glory. My prayer all week has been that somehow, as a result of God's word going out in this church this morning, we would be a people who live passionately for his praise today and tomorrow and every single day so that Wellsboro and beyond knows the goodness and the worth of God. Let us as a church live to declare his greatness. Praise his name. So as we close, I want to give you that opportunity. I actually want us to stand and sing the doxology together. So do you rise, and the words will be up on the screen. Sorry you don't have Josh or Steph. You're going to have my voice to suffer through. If you could just hit the clear background button, that psalm will go away. Which I think in the top right... There's like a clear, clear all, and then you can click on that lyric again. Thank you. Okay, church, let's sing this. Praise God from